this morning the scriptures from the New International Version, Corinthians chapter 1, the whole chapter. <laughs> on, on the screen it's from the New International Version, but I'm going to sing, sing it. I'm going to read it from... <laughs> I'm going to read it. Sandy says no, Bob says no. <laughs> From the King James Version. And to be honest, they're, they're very similar. So if you follow along on the screen and maybe listen to the King James Version. Now concerning special, special <coughs> gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. <clears throat> For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severely as he will. As for the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the one whole body were an eye, were <coughs> where we where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? <clears throat> but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need for thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism of the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, 
first apostles, secondly, prophets, thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covered earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Here ended the lesson. For a line by line analysis of our scripture reading today. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I love this church so much because I, th I think, man, if somebody were just spying in on us, they would think we don't know what the heck we're doing. You know, oh, she forgets the offering and we're making fun of the person reading the scripture. And, but th that is why I love this church because God is here and he is in this place and we are a family. And, and that's what families do. And so I just, I want you to know, let's, let's keep up our imperfection because it's really, it's really good stuff, you know? You can't make it up. <laughs> so I feel like every time I come up here, I have to bear a little bit more of my soul to you. And, and I'm sure you walk away thinking, wow, I didn't know that about her. So here's my secret for today, okay? I come from a long line of mediocre musicians. <laughs> and I am so proud of it. Yeah, I was, I will tell you, I was first violin in fifth and sixth grade. I was pretty proud of that. I was first chair clarinet in middle school, although Judy, I wanted to play flute, and mom said no, because my brother played clarinet, and we already had the clarinet, so I had to play the clarinet. <laughs> it's true. I can do a really mean rendition of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star <laughs> on the piano. And you know, the acoustics in my shower tell me that I should be in concert, like <laughs> any day. I, I have apparently missed that calling, that, that I have star quality. You know? Sadly, natural musical talent is not a gift that was handed down through my family line, and I think maybe that's why I've always been so fascinated with music, I'm really fascinated with listening to it and watching people at that craft, and I just think it's awesome when people have that gift to share, and actually, my first memories, my first real musical memories are putting Barry Manilow on my mom's record player and dancing to Copacabana on her bed in front of the mirror, you know, fantasizing my life in stardom. <laughs> and I still have a really hard time not moving if I hear a beat. Yeah, I, I don't understand people who can sit like this with music. If you're one of those people, no offense. I just I have to move, and it mortifies Caitlin. It mortifies my older daughter because I come up and dance on her all the time. And the best part is that Kendall, the younger one, she's right there with me. She's a mover and a shaker, too, and so, so we have a really good time tormenting <laughs> Caitlin in our house. So it, it's really, really safe to say that I'm very limited in my musical abilities, but unlimited in my appreciation for people with musical abilities. And, you know, one of my favorite parts of a really good concert is, yeah, I love, I love the main singer belting away, but I really love the parts closer to the end where they take a minute and they kind of introduce all of the band members. And usually they'll even give everybody a chance to do a little solo and they get to kind of show off what they're able to do, even though they've been working in the background. I love that recognition for even the most minor member of the band. And I actually, I learned from Amanda Miskell on Thursday, we went to a concert this week, and when they were doing their little introductions, I don't know, one of the guys' names was Tom. She'd be like, yeah, Tom, way to go, Tom. And it never occurred to me to actually cheer individually for them by name. So I'm going to start doing that now, and I, I think you should do that too. But I don't underestimate just how much goes into putting together a really powerful piece of music a really powerful experience for somebody who's getting to, to watch and listen and feel that beat all the way down into their soul and, and how valuable every component is to that overall sound. From, from your drummer, who usually gets a really, really good applause, all the way down to that lonely soul playing the cowbell, you know? Because you can never have too much cowbell in a song. So, 
this idea uh, of individuals contributing to a larger picture, to something unified and um, to this overall scene, it's really just a popular illustration of how God wants us to work, how he wants us to work for humanity and, and for culture and for the church with a big capital C, but also for the local church, for Hillside. And Paul addresses this in, in his uh, letter to the Corinthians, First uh, Corinthians and Second both. And Bobby read for us from First Corinthians, and this was um, a church that was established in ancient Greece. And as he's writing this letter to the church, it, it's, it's a mess. You have to understand that that early church at Corinth was a mess. And we really shouldn't be surprised by this. I mean, we've had a whole lot more practice at it, and we still have our messy moments too, right? This was the early church. And you see, Corinth, it was a really bustling city. It was a center for art and for trade and for business, and there were a lot of people passing through. And when you have a lot of people with a lot of diversity passing through, um, that can tend to create some issues for people. It tends to create a lot of distractions. And so you had a large population. Um, it was a mix of nationalities and a mix of religions and home to the temple of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, and everything that goes along with that. And so you can imagine that there were some, some kind of unsavory practices that happened in this city and that then kind of filtered their way a little bit into the church as well because just like Hillside, that church was made of imperfect people trying to follow a perfect God. And so it's no wonder that this new group of Christians, they really struggled to, to be as disciplined as Paul was encouraging them to be. They really struggled with following all of the, the things that they knew they should be doing because there was just so much other stuff happening around them. And so Paul heard about this, kind of heard it through the grapevine, had some letters written to him saying, help! And so this letter is his response to that. And among the dissension in this church that was divided was the question of, of gifts, of gifting, and essentially, um, which gift of the Holy Spirit is the most important? If we have to rank them, if we have to number them, which one's better than the other? What's the hierarchy, Paul, of spiritual gifts so that we know which ones are better than the others and, and we know which ones of us are better than the others because we might exhibit that particular gift. Who's more favored, Paul? Who's more important? Who gets the trophy for the best spiritual gift? Tell us. And Paul says, well, no one. No one gets the trophy for the best spiritual gift. And he says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And I can imagine Paul's exasperation here. What do you mean? Which one is best? Which gift is most important? Why do you care if one is better than the other? One Spirit, people. Many gifts. One Spirit. One God. And it's not about you or your talent or your performance or your prominence, but it's about using that gift not for your good, but for the common good, for the good of all. And they were missing that part. And he goes on to explore this, this extended metaphor, the English teacher's dream of the human body, an examination of how each part is essential to the overall functioning of the whole. Even the parts we can't see, the, the internal organs, they're just as critical, just as purposeful, not to be taken for granted. Our hands and, and our feet and our eyes and our tongue, we see them function. We recognize their worth, and we can't really imagine functioning without them, but we don't really take any notice of what's happening internally, of all the systems that have to be working in harmony for us to even be able to move our hands and our feet and to think, and to breathe, and to do what we have to do in order to live. It all works independently and in concert with each other to keep us functioning in a healthy way. And, and we don't notice, do we, until one of those parts stops working. 
no longer functions the way that it's supposed to function. Then we say, oh, whoa, something's wrong here. Something's not right. We have to figure out how to fix this. And of course, I'm a little bit cynical. And so part of me wants to say, well, yeah, Paul, but you know, we really don't need all of our parts. Not every part is really essential. I mean, you have the appendix. What does it do? And wisdom teeth? I mean, hello, save us the pain of having to have them cut out, right? We don't need wisdom teeth. We can function without a limb. We can function without our different senses. We can function without a kidney, right? It's true, we can. But do we function at maximum potential? Do we function fully? Are we in full health if one piece of the body is missing or is ill, is not performing the way that it's really intended to perform, not doing what it's really intended to do? We're not. And so likewise, Paul's asking them to consider, you know, are you at maximum health as a church if one member is missing or if one member is not using the gift that that one spirit, that that one God has given them to serve the common good. Whether it's the gift of teaching a Bible study or the gift of rocking babies in the nursery or the gift of shaking hands when people walk in the door. All of those gifts provided by the same spirit on behalf of the common good. Are we truly, truly healthy if one of those pieces is missing or isn't functioning? Do we want to be a healthy church? I do. I hope you do too. But truthfully, before we even address that, this whole idea of calling and of spiritual gifts, you know, Chris has been talking about calling all month, it feels a little overwhelming sometimes, to me anyway. I mean, it takes me sometimes ridiculous amounts of time to figure out what to eat for breakfast. And so then to have to figure out, okay, God, what do you want me to do today? Like, that just feels a little bit more than what I'm capable of. And words are really powerful. And I think when we throw around this word calling in Christianese, it has a whole lot of power. And I think it's one of those words that has the potential to really scare people away from the church to really scare them away from a relationship with God because, man, calling, whew, that, sounds like, that sounds like something I can't do. That, that sounds like something beyond my understanding. And what I've always associated with calling is the idea of burning bushes and audible voices and choirs of angels coming and, and sharing a message. I mean, that, that's what calling has always felt like to me. But you know, I don't really see that happening a whole lot these days. <laughs> and in fact, it's not that God couldn't or wouldn't. He can, and he might. I don't know. But you know, there are only like 100 people in the Bible who actually had that type of calling experience. So if we're looking for how the Bible and its teachings are relevant to us today, I think we have to try to come to a better understanding of what calling means for us. And what I've learned instead is that, that I think there's definitely a calling for every one of us, but I think at its core, for each of us, it's, it's the same calling. We all have the same calling. Our essential calling, the core of all of it, is to be united to God through Christ in every aspect of our lives. That is my calling and your calling and your neighbor's calling and the greeter at Walmart's calling. Everybody has the same calling from God to be united in relationship with him through Jesus Christ in every part of our lives. And what that says to me is that I have a calling in my family life. That in my family I have a role to play that ensures that Christ is part of how I function as a mother and a wife and a daughter and a friend and all of those other family roles that I play. 
and I have a calling in my work life, and you say, well, duh, you're, you're up there, you're talking. I'm not even talking about being up here and sharing a message with you. We all have a calling in our work life, and that's to ensure that Christ is part of our role as an employee, as an employer, as a supervisor, as a producer, as a whatever it is that you do in your working life. Christ is to be at the center of it. I have a calling in my personal life. In my personal life, I have a role to play to ensure that Christ is part of how I um, view and care for my physical and my mental and my emotional health and the entertainment that I consume and the activities that I choose to participate in. That's all part of my calling into that relationship with God. And I have a calling in my public life. In my public life, I have a role to play that ensures that Christ is part of how I interact with other people. Whether that's at the grocery store, or on the highway, or on social media, or in this church, my calling and your calling is to ensure that Christ is at the center of all of that. Because you see, when we accept Christ, this is the calling that we're answering. We're saying yes to grace, We're saying yes to forgiveness, yes to salvation, yes to a unity with to God through his son. The next step then is to say, yes, God, use me, send me, work through me, and our personal ministry field, and yes, you have a personal ministry field, whether you want to or not, it becomes wide open. How that plays out then depends on the depth of our relationship with God and the specific gifts that he has given each of us to use. But I think we get caught in the same trap that that early church at Corinth got caught in. We accept Christ. We say, yes, use me. And then we look around and we get a little scared. Use me, Lord, but don't ask me to do that. Use me, but oh, don't send me there, please. Because we're not really sure what we're good at. And we're pretty certain that we don't quite have our lives together enough yet for God to really use us, maybe someday. And we certainly don't have our lives together as much as those other people we see serving in the church. And well, I mean, all those other people, they're doing a really good job where they're serving. So we'll just... We'll stand over here and watch. We'll keep coming on Sundays, and we'll wait for that burning bush that tells us what God wants us to do, and we'll, we'll ignore the whisper, we'll ignore the nudge that tells us as we sit in our seats that it's time to get out of them. It's time to step up, and it's time to serve, to take that next move forward. But we fall victim. The church falls victim to the evil of comparison and insecurity and the noise that gets created by busyness. I mean, let's face it, if you had a burning bush here, would you would you be able to like notice it and listen to it? You'd probably pay notice. When we have all this other distraction happening, and it's not a burning bush, but it's a whisper. It's so easy to ignore. And we shouldn't be surprised. We do the same with our physical bodies, don't we? I do. So of course we would do the same with the metaphorical body of Christ. I mean, my hair is too straight, my hair is too curly, my thighs are too big, my thighs are twigs, my muscles are hidden by a little bit of jiggle, I'm so thin they call me Flat Stanley. You know, we do that. If I only had her hair, or his chest, or her metabolism, or his genes, if only, if only, if only, worthy. And the same doubt creeps into our relationship with God and our willingness to do his work. If only I knew more about the Bible, then I could teach a class. If only I could kick this horrible habit, then I could volunteer. If only my family weren't such a mess, then I'd be more involved. 
If only I'd been raised in the church as a child and not just now figuring all of this stuff out. If only I were good at teaching or speaking, well, then God would have a use for me or music. If only I had his wisdom or her charisma, his outgoing personality, her confidence, their history. If only, if only, if only, well, then I'd be worthy. And I get it, because I'm not immune to those thoughts myself. And the only difference between some of you and me is that I said yes anyway. Still think those thoughts. But I said yes anyway. And you're sitting among people who said yes anyway, despite the doubts, despite the fears. They quit looking around and comparing their worth and their abilities and their gifts, and they said yes. Whatever it is, yes. And there are people who will gladly walk with you to figure out what your gifts are and where you can serve and what your role can be um, and, your, and your place both in the larger church but also here at Hillside. And in those moments of my own doubt, when I question how God is really wanting to use me, and I put myself under the microscope, microscope to scrutinize my own unworthiness and inability. And I'm telling you, it, it's real. Do not be fooled by what people put out there on the exterior because what's in here is still going on. But there are two passages that I turn to as reminders of God's goodness and of his desire for my life. And maybe these will help you too, I don't know. But I turn first to Jeremiah 1.5. In the Old Testament, when God calls the young prophet Jeremiah and says to him, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I set you apart. He's saying, when I read this, I, I feel like I'm being told... You had an essence before you were ever a twinkle in your mom and dad's eye. You already meant something. You were given a divine purpose before you ever took a breath on this earth. God formed you intentionally to know you and to love you and to have a relationship with you. And in a culture that is all about comparison and competition and self-improvement, God said from the beginning, there is no one like you. There is no one who can do in this world what I need for you to do. There is no one with your specific purpose because I set you apart. How do we not respond to that? How do we not respond? And let me share a little secret with you. If, you, if you're battling those if-onlys and the comparison and, and the doubt, Paul has an answer to that. So let's think for a minute. Logically, what would follow 1 Corinthians 12? Participation. 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah, good. Sharp today. <laughs> Yeah, and that one actually is probably familiar to you. Even if you're like, 1 Corinthians 13, I don't know, think wedding. Because it was probably read in your wedding. All about love is patient. Love is kind. But before we even get to that, Paul has something to say. Because we think of it as the love chapter. We call it the love chapter. But do you know that it actually connects to 1 Corinthians 12 in relationship with gifts, spiritual gifting, and God's call, and, and our worthiness? Because at the end of our reading today comes my second go-to passage. Paul says to the Corinthians, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, not, not for your own good, Corinthians, but for the common good. We want you to want to do well. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. And then he leaves us hanging for a minute. And what is the most excellent way? Well, what is the topic of 1 Corinthians 13? What do we call it? The what chapter? Love. The love chapter. Love is the most excellent way. 
It all comes down to love. And he says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So this notion of calling, it all comes down to love. The purpose of God's gifting, whatever the gift is that he has given each of you, is not to create a hierarchy. It's not to create a means of comparison. The purpose of God's gifting in each of us is to demonstrate his love to the world. In whatever way you're meant to demonstrate that. Our primary calling, guys, the one that we all share, is the call to relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his son, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but because he loves us. And in that call to relationship with him, we are to love God in return with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul. And in response to the love that we share with him, we are then to love our neighbors as ourselves. I think we need to love our neighbors probably better than we love ourselves sometimes. And one way that we demonstrate that love is by using the gifts that God himself gave us when he set us apart. Using those gifts, whatever they may be, large or small, highly public or completely behind the scenes, using those gifts all to the glory of God. And so as you leave here today, I hope that you will wrestle with a couple of things. I hope you'll have a couple of questions churning and burning and, and trying to figure out. First, have you answered the call to be in relationship with God? Because that is the most important, and we know that. That is a matter of salvation. That is a matter of eternity. And until that call is answered, none of the rest of it really matters. Are you answering the call to make God and his son, Jesus Christ, the center of every area of your life, not just your Sunday church attendance, every area of your life? Are you fulfilling your call as a parent, as a friend, as a spouse, as a child, as an employee, as a servant? Have you said yes to that yet? What does that look like? And if yes, pat yourself on the back. I guess you're done till next week, so no, no further questioning for you. But I would imagine that most of us are we're not really there if we really examine. So what's holding you back? Where are you sabotaging your own demonstration of love because of comparison or self-doubt or insecurity? And how can you overcome it? There's one who is more powerful than those fears and those doubts and those insecurities. And he's the one who set us apart. And he's the one who calls us to him. And he's the one who gives us purpose and capabilities beyond our own imagining. And it's time we said yes to God and yes to our church and yes to love. And it's time that we live in God's concert and not in life's concert.